Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe and share this episode. Joining me today is Jonathan Goldhill, business coach and author of Disruptive Successor. He challenges family businesses to think differently, to become game changers and grow. Thanks for being on the show today, Jonathan. Thank you very much, John. Pleasure so to be ex- here. Yeah, I'm excited to hear a little bit about your journey, how you got to where you are. Uh, so maybe share with the audience members um, where you're from, how yep. you became you know, now a coach, uh, yep. an author, and what brought you to where you are today. Yeah, so uh, my journey is uh, I'm from the East Coast. I grew up in a suburb of New York City. My family lived, uh, grew up in Long Island. I grew up in Westchester, New York. And my grandfather on my maternal side had built a large, successful business, a clothing business, manufacturing men's suits and overcoats. Um, he had did it with his brothers and their father. It was called Joseph H. Cohn and Sons. And it was kind of the legacy in our family, which is that there was this very large clothing company that employed literally thousands of people. And it was so successful that by the time I was like a young adult, my grandfather was already pretty much a, a philanthropist, a so active social light in the community, was building or having his name be put on the wing of a hospital that he helped maybe raise the money for. So there was a lot of stewardship and giving back. And, and uh, um, he was a painter, an artist. You'll see uh, one of his works right over my, uh, my shoulder here. And uh, his daughter, my mother, was also an artist. And I have one of her pieces on my other side. So that, uh, that artistic freedom is something that has really been pretty uh, pronounced in me in my life. When I was 20, I moved to California to go to school uh, across the country. I arrived in a t- town called Santa Barbara. And if you've ever been to Santa Barbara, uh, you'd understand why one would never leave there. It's one of the most beautiful towns in the United States. It's like paradise. Um, I stayed in California. And for the next 10 years, I was involved in what I would call a a mix of personal growth, personal development. Uh, I was an early promoter of Tony Robbins, his his firewalk. I I was uh, in and I stepped, walked out of, but I was one of the first people to go into the Landmark Forum with Werner Erhard, who was the founder of the Erhard Seminars Trainings, which was known as EST. Um, I did a lot of personal development and personal growth. And then I was also involved in social change and being involved in organizing communities around causes and issues. And uh, I did grassroots fundraising. And you know, I realized that My sociology degree was being put to good use by organizing communities, but it was then I kind of got the bug for getting involved in a business. So I started an art and clothing company when I was in my mid-20s. It was uh, hand-painted, wearable art. It was really amazing stuff, but I had a tremendous difficulty managing a business partner who was a, a kind of a crazy wild artist. He was into women, he was into drugs, and he was into things that I couldn't control. So that, that sent me to, back to business school to get an MBA. Uh, I got an MBA at USC, which is University of Southern California, studied entrepreneurship and management consulting. And you know the rest of the journey is like chapter two, which was I got into running a consulting firm, building a consulting firm, scaling that up. It was a uh, a private nonprofit economic development firm where we did consulting, training, and financing. And then the next 30 years, it was just sort of meandering and changing the delivery of some form of consulting, coaching, training, a la, you know, uh, uh, e myth type uh, work with small business owners. And, you know, a lot of it was consulting, helping them get financing, get loans, get. Uh, uh, learn about how to market, sell, manage their finances. So it was teaching and starting an entrepreneurship program and teaching them. And then uh, eventually I went from consulting to coaching. And that's what I've been doing now for the last, uh, well, since 2004. So last 17 years. 
Wow. So it's a long story, but that's uh, that's the story. It was, you know, my family's success in the in the clothing business and in the family business really brought me full circle to being really interested in family businesses as a as an organization, as an institution, and. And just because I was raised by an artist and a therapist, uh, I really think I play well working in the space between, oftentimes it's a father and son, but it might be a father and daughter or mother and daughter, um, dealing with being able to communicate to both sides really well, but really coaching that G2, generation two leader, who's typically a millennial, who's looking to scale up, who has a bigger vision. Than, uh, than maybe their parents did. And my typical client is someone who's taking over a family business from what was probably a technician type entrepreneur. And they didn't have any of the, the management systems, the processes. Um, and they're, you know, they're looking at redefining what their purpose is, what their why is. They're putting core values in place. They're building a new team with, you know, a, a different culture. And they're taking the business probably from a seven-figure to an eight-figure business. So that that's typically my, uh, that's the space that I play in. Is there specific niches that you focus on or is it very broad? Yeah. So family businesses tend to be in the unsexy industries. And unsexy, you know, would be a lot of construction companies, real estate, property management, real estate, not so much because they oftentimes there's not a lot in managing a real estate business unless they have built quite an empire. Typically, they have their own family office and they're running that. So I tend to focus mostly on construction and trades companies. It's just become a niche. In 2007, I started working with landscape companies, and it opened up a huge world. Um, One, I have a tremendous appreciation uh, for the beauty that landscape provides, um, whether it's at a residential or a commercial uh, facility. And then the really successful landscape companies are basically operationally run businesses. They're maintenance companies, and they're sending out crews to maintain properties. And so you have to be a really good operator to run a business like that. But those became good businesses for me. They're diversified services type firms. And, you know, be, based on that, working with any type of service business, whether it's a, an IT consulting services or an advertising and marketing or a search engine type, you know, it's uh, marketing services businesses, all makes sense. Because at the end of the day, John, most businesses are about managing people and about getting them to align to a vision and getting them all to understand what the priorities are and get them huddling in meetings where they're going over their priorities and accomplishing and tackling them. And so it's about teaching people how to lead, about how to be good time managers and be good communicators and how to resolve conflict. And so all that stuff really plays out well in, in family businesses where there's sometimes inherent conflict and and there's trust issues and so uh helping that type that that group of people is just kind of a, a passion of mine yeah, that's amazing to hear and it sounds like you know the art end of things is great for um interior designers or you know y- you look at the, the landscapers right and you go you look at like how important it is for exterior landscape. So that's the art piece. And then the operations is more, of course, if you scale with multiple crews, it's it makes sense, right? Then you need system processes, you need huddles, you need management to manage the, the people properly with the same vision and goal. So that's great to hear. Was there a specific um, market that, uh, I mean, not market, I mean, I mean geo-target region that you focused on before you started expanding outwards? Or was there a sole focus on a niche and a market before you then refine your your kind of industries? Yeah. So when I first got out of business school and the consulting agency, this nonprofit economic development was strictly community based. So everything I did was in the San Fernando Valley, which if you're a Los, An- Los Angeles person, you know that to be a, a pretty large valley. It's made up of... Uh, tremendous number of post-production and production companies that feed 
the Hollywood entertainment uh, industry. And these are small companies. Some of them are, you know, they're the food trucks, the food services business. They, they bring, uh, there's all the below the line talent stuff. And a lot of those production companies are actually real companies. Most things in the movie business aren't companies. They're projects that get together as teams. Um, and then also in the San Fernando Valley is a lot of machine shops. Machine shops were, here because they provided the parts and tools and nuts and bolts for the aerospace industry, which was very predominant in Southern California. It's not so much here. Um, so I spent all of my years for the first 10 years of consulting, working with um, those types of companies, small manufacturing and business services company. And then of course, there's all the locally needed goods and services. So the real small moms, moms and pops, you know, the dry cleaners, the uh, whatever, the car washes, the, the hair salons, the, the, the companies that are living off of the, the wealth, if you will, of, of all those other entrepreneurial businesses and, and people who have jobs. So for most of my career, it was spent focused on that, on that local niche. It was when I started to realize as a coach that it would be really helpful for my marketing if I picked a niche and um, I could start to network in that niche. And so that's when I focused on the landscape industry. And I specifically focused on the California Landscape Contractors Association and the members that were in that organization. And I started getting my articles in their chapter newsletters, which continue to this day. So like 10 plus years later, my articles are still running in local chapter newsletters of landscape industry publications. And then I scale, then I, you know, expanded or scaled my business to, well, why not serve all contractors in, in that are in the landscape industry in California? And then I kept trying to make attempts to get into other verticals in the construction industry. Um, a little bit in the roofing, a little bit in the plumbing, a little bit in janitorial. And I didn't have as much success in those other niches because, well, for one reason, there's so many more landscape companies than some of these other trades because, well, like hair salons, you know, most of us need to get our hair cut every week. And so, uh, you know, landscape grows. Plumbing, roofing, you know, you don't fix that stuff all too often in your house. You don't get, you know, your home remodeled but every maybe 10 years. So the landscape industry really stuck. And I did some of that work nationally with the National Association of Landscape Professionals. But I didn't, I found that once I got onto the national forum, there were many other coaches like me who had run landscape companies and now were landscape coaches as well. So I kind of retreated back to working mostly on the Western states and did clients work with clients in Texas and Colorado and uh, mostly the Southwest, where they weren't dealing with uh, snow conditions and they had a year-round business. Um, and at this point, my clients are all over the Western states and they're, they're in roofing, they're in transportation, they're in um, HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, they're in plumbing, they're in janitorial, so they're in real estate, property management, so it's a real mix. That's amazing to hear. And I wanted to ask you, um, I know your grandparents were successful business owners. Did you gain a lot of insight during the tenure of you becoming your own coach and mentor um, to, you know, grasp some ideas and concepts and, you know, some input from them? Or were there other great successful coaches, mentors that you leaned on to give you some guidance and advice to move you along to the career path that you're uh, living in today? Yeah, great question. For me in particular, John, my grandfather, once I was probably around 21 years old, he was already having what we thought was Alzheimer's and it turned out to be strokes. So the ability to learn from him, you know, in the areas that would have interested me, um, which really weren't kicking, those interests in business weren't really kicking in until my mid to late 20s. He was just not present and, uh, um, and then not alive. He, he died in nine, as 93, so he died in 1992. So it was a long time ago. So I, as a result 
um, after coming out of business school, always was seeking out mentors, coaches. Um, I have a, a file folder of all the coaches and all the materials that I started working with. I mean, my first coach I hired in 2001 when I started my own practice as a consultant. And I have been in and out of working with coaches for the last 20 years. Okay. So I've, I've probably had 20 coaches. Some were only like, you know, I tried them for a month or two and it wasn't the right fit. Some I was there for a few years with them. I probably never lasted more than three years with any one coach, but I might have come back to them. But I, you know, I do find that coaches are good for a, a reason and oftentimes a season. And if they're a really good coach, you know, multiple seasons. As as a coach myself now since 2004, uh, my longest tenured client is probably seven years. I've had a couple that lasted for seven, eight, nine years, but for the most part, you know, the average about three years. Yeah. So. I, and I think you just hit in the nail. I think when you're seeking out a coach, you need to figure out where you want to be. You got to have self-realization and then pick for the purpose because these coaches are great at specific, you know, situations and problems that you have. And therefore you can seek it out. And based on that time frame of what you're, where you're at in your business to where you want to be, they can resolve it and help you expedite that time. So yep. can, can you think of maybe a couple coaches uh, during this tenure of yours that really stood out and why? Yeah. Um, so one coach that really stood out, uh, his name was Michael Cody. His partner was Eric Dombach. Um, their company was called The Coach's Coach. They came out of, uh, both came out of uh, having successful uh, franchises with Action Coach. Um, Action Coach was arguably the, the world's largest uh, coaching franchise organization, started by Brad Sugars. Um, so what was unique about Michael and Eric's partnership uh, or, or coaching program was, well, one, they brought most many of the tools that Action Coach has that people would pay $75,000 for that franchise. And they delivered it in such a way that you literally could buy this thing for hundreds of dollars a month. I mean, um, you know, plus the one-on-one -on -one coaching, it was, it was super affordable. So that stood out. But, but the real distinction was that they gave me tools that I could use to not only improve my marketing and my selling. Um, these were video tutorials along with actual like instruments, like here's a letter to send out to dry cleaners. Here's a letter to send out to carpet cleaners. Here's a letter. I mean, so it was very, some really specific uh, stuff. Some, you know, much of it, which I didn't even use, but I certainly, like I used their landscaper letter and it certainly was helpful. I landed a client that I, I probably spent $400 on a mailing and landed a client that generated over $100,000 in income. So that's a pretty good ROI. Um, but it, so, you know, the, the use of their tools changed my way of thinking. And so that was definitely uh, a coach that stood out. Um, I also joined a few years later, also on the advice of, of Michael Cody and his, 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 you know, his background. I, you know, I joined Scaling Up Coach. Um, I looked at, uh, it was called Gazelles at the time. I was considering traction and EOS, and, and I, that ultimately would have been a better fit, but the community of scaling up coaches was more to my liking. It's a more intellectually rigorous uh, organization you know, you know, of people. They're focused on not just execution and people and implementing a system, which EOS largely is basically you know, implementers of this stuff. Um, scaling up is a more open architecture system where you're reading tons of books. You know, all those books that are on your shelf probably are all part of the scaling up ecosystem of recommended books. Just, you know, read 10 pages from the book scaling up and 20 books pop out as like, oh, these are must go to reads, you know. So, um, so it wasn't a single coach in the scaling up network, but again, it was a framework with tools um, that, 
was the difference. So I think, uh, you know, it's great to have a relationship. I had a relationship with a coach who didn't really use any real tools. And I got a, a lot of benefit from just talking to him, but he was really expensive. Um, he was the person who gave me the impetus to write my book. And he helped me to define my ideal client profile in, in a way that has really served me. But I would say that the ROI wasn't quite there because he wasn't really giving me the tools. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it with this. Buckminster Fuller, the, the architect, uh, the creator of the geodesic dome, uh, the futurist thinker, he basically said, you know, give a man a tool and you'll, you'll teach a man to think differently, you know. And so uh, I think it's really true. To, the use of tools gets you to think differently. So I'm a big fan of books that have practical takeaway tools that you can implement in your business. And that's the Rockefeller Habits, the Scaling Up book, the Traction book, things like that. That's amazing. Um, question, growing up, did you envision yourself to be who you are today? Or was there another kind of dream you know, job or a position that you want to become or a business owner? Like, who did you really want to envision to be very similar to while you were young, mid-20s to now where you are today? That's a really good question. And uh, one of the few memories, I don't really have a memory of thinking that I was going to be anything in particular or had a career aspiration. And I think I was quite sarcastic uh, uh, about it at the time. Um, you know, the average kid would have said, I want to grow up to be a, you know, a fireman or a police or something like that. And I was really young. So I used to be kind of sarcastic and say, I want to grow up to be a fire truck, which is sort of, but I, what I, what I did say, and I did realize was, um, I said, I want a high pay, low hour job. And I used to say that a lot. And unfortunately, um, neither my mother or my stepfather were really uh, entrepreneurial. My stepfather started an entrepreneurial business, but it really wasn't terribly successful. He was a better, he was a poet and a playwright and a, a gifted Harvard educated, like a full scholarship, very smart guy. Um, but the, the entrepreneurial thing came from my grandfather and I just wasn't as connected to that. So I did get what I want. I, uh, as a solo uh, entrepreneur, solo lifestyle business owner, I mean, I'm, I'm not, well, I don't consider myself an entrepreneur. I've done entrepreneurial things. I've been a bit of a maverick in my business. I've definitely carved out a nice coaching and consulting career for myself, but I have essentially a high pay, low hour job. When I quit this job, this business isn't going to be worth anything to anyone. And so, you know, had I had an entrepreneurial uh, parent, um, I probably would have been thinking much bigger. I would have been thinking in terms of how can I reach many more people? How can I create systems? How can I turn my learning and knowledge into something that could be, you know, sold like a product over and over? I, I just didn't do it like that. I love what I do. Don't get me wrong. I'm what I really call a business therapist. It's what I wanted to do when I got out of business school in 1989. So for 30 years, I've been a really, I think I'm a gifted business therapist, but uh, you know, not every business person wants a therapist. A lot of people want to just you know, buy a book or you know, buy a training program and have it be inexpensive. And you know, so that just wasn't the path that I took. So I guess I got what I wanted, but yeah. It, it wasn't a bigger calling other than being a fire truck. <laughs> so um, do you feel that your, your career has been a success? And what do you, did you envision to be as someone that is successful? Um, can you share with the audience members what that would look like? And if you believe you are successful currently? Yeah. So, John, great question. And a really challenging one. Um, I, I don't feel that I've been a great success, and uh, I've had to redefine success in my life a lot. 
because I never really had a definition of what success looks like. I mean, arguably, I grew up uh, in an w- affluent family feeling successful from the outset. So I think there's a sense of confidence, self-confidence that I have about um, about the way I think, about my wisdom, uh, about choices I've made in my life. But I never, I never went after what would be the traditional things that one would judge success by, which is, you know, do you have the most toys? Do you have the most houses? Do you live on, in the biggest house on the, you know, on the highest hill? Um, I didn't pursue those things, and so I've always been challenged by redefining what success is for me. And I do feel that as I am maturing. And realize and recognizing that I provide a lot of value to my clients and to the right people, um, to the right clients. I coach them in ways that has really transformed their lives and their businesses. And you know that's a great success. And so I'm I'm still learning to redefine success. I encourage people to define success by their own standards, their own measures, not by the standards and measures that. Um, necessarily are prescribed in, in a capitalist society where it's like he who has the most toys or the most money is the most successful. Because look, the truth is, is that, you know, the richest people in the world aren't necessarily like the happiest or the most successful. And it does afford you privilege, but, you know, own, having a lot of money and, and a lot of things also comes with a tremendous amount of responsibility. So. That's a great answer, Jonathan. And I love that you're putting a lot of perspective in it. Like as you age in different stages of your life, you're going to have big uh, ideas around choices, right? What you need to do, what, what does success sound and look like? And then now that you've had a lot of choice along the years, understanding that people who don't have choices, they have to realize that stop judging, right? Stop living up to other people's expectations, live with your own and whatever brings happiness to you, like, like you mentioned, that's what life is about, right? Like it's all about the people that you can impact and touch, the things that you can do to really make a little difference in people's lives to bring out the most of them, right? And yes, it might be just your family, your friends. It could be a community. It could be your colleagues or your you know hobbies and interests, whatever it may be. Just do the best you can to bring fulfillment in your life and waking up wanting to do a little bit more, right? And that's a great uh, thing that you mentioned. So, And, and, and you know, our, our legacy, if we start to think in terms of our life and our legacy, like there's a lot of time in life yeah. to figure out what your legacy is going to be. I mean, I'm just beginning to think about what my legacy project might be that will transform yet again my career. And I'm, I'm have some ideas about it, what it is. And it's related to coaching and business and, and related to other things that interest me like mental health and drug and, and substance abuse and addiction. And, you know, um, so it's, it's yet to be seen what that legacy program or project is going to be. And as you age, you become wise, right? And the wisdom that you bring to the table is unique. And yep. there are other people going through the same situation, the life events that you've gone through that you can maybe guide them and help them along the way. So, you know, me, taking action, doing something about it, and then owning up to it and moving forward. Because even as I'm in my 40s, I feel like I could impact a lot of people that are in their 20s and 30s with yep. some of the life experiences I've endured and the challenges um, so that they don't make the same mistakes as I have. Uh, I know you're in your 60s and you've lived a lot more life than I have and a lot of people are chasing that more money chasing that ideal job or whatever that may never happen right so slowly understand where you're coming from and have a self-realization like yes you can work hard yes you got to think differently but do something with it take actions hire a coach read books go join a community go out there seek advice because there's people out there that want to support you along the way. Just surround yourself with positive, like-minded people. If you don't do that, you're going to go through the spiral of, you know, mental health and depression and 
you know, figuring, trying to figure it out without acknowledging what you need to fix, which is usually mindset, right? And that's what you need to start with. Yeah. You know, one of the teachers that uh, uh, I, I briefly touched when I was a young adult was uh, Ram, Ram Das, who uh, wrote a book called Be Here Now. Um, I only remember the introduction and the sort of uh, the crazy hallucination he had while he was either in a meditation or on some, you know, hallucinogenic. Um, but the words be here now always stuck. And the, the value of being centered and grounded and using tools like meditation or yoga or um, maybe for you, it's, you know, Wim Hof's method, but of getting really present, like incredibly present with your feelings and your uh, and being transparent about that and authentic and sharing that with other people. I, I mean, I, the more I work with leaders um, who have to coach others, the, the more powerful I see that they become when they become present with who they really are and start to clean up and address some of their bad habits so that they can become more, um, more consciously aware of how to get people to follow them. Um, oh, and amazing. so, yeah. yeah. Like just being present, right? Be here now. And I'm always telling people to slow down, focus on, you know, stay away from stuff that distracts you for attention, right? You know, is it email, social media? Just live life with the person that you're actually speaking to currently and give it committed time and listen, engage intently, right? And focus on like adding value in people's lives, right? And the more you do that, and that's a skill altogether, acknowledging where your gaps are. And I feel like me being in sales for 10 years and then running this business for eight, I've gotten really good at just focus and time allocation and being present when I'm here because I want to optimize my life, not just, you know, business and people I surround myself with, but also like my family time, my, you know, work time, my interest time, travel time, just focus on what you really want to do and do it the best way you can. Every aspect of it. I think everyone will like this. Uh, so my coach, uh, Michael Cody, he gave this to me. He said, you know, focus is an acronym. It stands for follow one course until successful. Mm. And it, it's always stuck, um, which is, you know, too many of us get distracted and too many of us entrepreneurs are ADD. And so we have to manage that ADD. And one of the ways we have to do it is to basically focus and follow a course. No, so very powerful. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I have a problem with is I have too many projects on the go and I just need someone to really push me to focus on like ones that will move the needle the most. And right. I think a lot of business owners are similar. They yep. throw different ideas, they start sending it to the staff, and then everyone's not sure what they should focus on. Um, yeah. I, I just have a couple questions, uh, sure. Jonathan, to end this off. Um, any advice that you can give a lot of the business owners who are in business, starting a business, what can you guide them with some of the coaching advice or stuff that you've learned over the years on things to look forward to, things not to make as many mistakes on and uh, whatnot. So, you know, any champion is only a champion when they're surrounded by a, 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 a champions, a championship team and you make that championship team. You, you build it, you, you create it. And so to build your championship team, surround yourself with people of complementary skills, complementary cognitive uh, thinking approaches, and, and leverage the talents of the entire team. So if you're a visionary, someone like yourself, John, maybe, who always has got like a million ideas, a million projects, then get yourself a number two person we call that, you know, a, a chief operating officer or second in command. Uh, um, in the book Rocket Fuel, they refer to it as a, an integrator to the visionary. Someone who can take all those different ideas you have and 
selectively choose which ones to implement and then rigorously drive them um, and execute them to completion. So if you're not a visionary and you're a really good detail execution person, then get yourself a visionary, someone who can push you to think bigger, even if it's just the coach that you work with, who will take a stand for what will your business, what do you want your life to look like in a year, in three years, in 10 years, you know, have someone who, who's your complement, um, who drives that, that, that type of thinking. And then, you know, use the behavioral uh, profiling tools that are available to us. I use DISC, Others might use Myers-Briggs or Colby Index, or there's so many that are out there. But surround yourself with people who have complementary um, talents, behavioral profiles, um, values, and motivators, because um, you want people in the right seats. Um, you want them doing the right things. And if everyone did the same things the way, did everything the way you did it, it probably would be a very lopsided uh, organization, right? You know, I'm a basketball fan and we're in basketball season right now. And, you know, you see the great players um, and the ones that I look back on, they were always teams that won it. Sometimes the teams are, are no all-stars. When everyone's an all-star on a team, it's really hard to build the team. When you've, you've got to have supporting roles, everyone is in their position and everyone is in their right seat. So, so focus first on your team. Do they fit? Do they share the same values? You know, can you build a strong culture um, with them? Can you build a winning team with them? Think about the franchise. Don't think about yourself first. So awesome. great advice, Jonathan. Can you talk a little bit more about the book that you wrote and some of the services that you offer? as well? Sure. So the book I wrote is called Disruptive Successor, A Guide to Driving Growth in Your Family Business. It's written uh, and it follows a little bit the story of, uh, of a G1 and G2 entrepreneur in a landscaping company where the G2 entrepreneur family member really wants to take the business to a whole new level. And so um, he becomes sort of my avatar in my book. And what my, what my book is about is a playbook for how to scale up a family business, how to take your parents' business that maybe was a one to $10 million business and how to turn it into a 10 to $100 million business. I provide each uh, reader with tools that you can download from my website, which is disruptivesuccessor.com. Um, but I, each chapter covers the playbook. I cover purpose, redefining your purpose. I talk about people. And I talk about processes and I talk about profit. And I think if I talk about each one of these uh, um, of my seven Ps in a slightly different way that uh, allows the reader to think about their business in a different way so they can start to implement um, the, the tools that I'm talking about in my book, which I think will transform their business. And so the coaching I provide helps them with implementation of these tools and other tools that I have at my disposal that I've built over 20 years or 30 years at this point. And I guide these next generation leaders um, or entrepreneurs on how to scale up using these tools. And so I provide, basically, I sit in with them on their weekly meetings. I have one-on-ones with them regularly. And once a quarter, we sit down for a day or two and plan out, strategically think about what do we want the business to look like in 90 days, in a year from now. And I help hold them to that vision and drive them towards the execution of it. And I help them make sure they get the right people on the bus so they can do it. And then, of course, you know, if they're needing to redefine their strategy so that their sales and marketing is more effective, we, we deal with that as well. That's amazing. Well, thanks a lot, Jonathan. Uh, one last question is, aside from your business ventures, what are some of the things that really trigger you to become or be the person you are today? Like, were there people, family is probably important to you, your daughter, like you mentioned, health. Um, now that you're settling in the South California area, and maybe you're following, you know, the Clippers right now, um, 
sports is a big thing. Community might be a big thing. What are some of the other pillars that mold you? Wow, that's a really great question and uh, one that deserves maybe a more thoughtful answer. Um, so I think a lot of the personal development work that I've done over the years, uh, it started with uh, you know guys like, well, people that people would know like Tony Robbins, um, but uh, you know the coaches that I've had, those have all been really great pillars, the sports heroes. Um, the ones that you really, you know, the Kobe Bryant's, the John Wooden's, the, the, I mean, I, I was a tremendous reader of, of all sorts of sports books when I was a kid growing up, whether it was Willie Mays or Rod Laver, the tennis, uh, champion or Arthur Ashe. I mean, I love the stories that really define people that you can learn from, um, Jack Welch from, uh, you know, his business books were some of them more impactful, just his autobiography about how he grew General Electric. I mean, I think all of these things uh, shape us. I do believe that everyone can be a mentor to everyone else. Um, I currently have a young man who I call my stepson living with me, who's a great teacher, my daughter, who's had uh, her struggles as a, a young adult, um, has been a great teacher. Um, you know, so it the whole, you know, look at every interaction, every person as a, uh, as someone who can shape us and make us better. And then I've always been a bit of an athlete. So uh, my cycling, uh, long distance cycling, my yoga, the meditation, uh, the other physical activities that I do on a regular basis um, have all shaped me to be the person I am today. That's amazing. I, I love this conversation. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. How can some of the listeners get a hold of you, reach out to you, or contact you directly? Sure. So several ways. Uh, one is on LinkedIn, uh, Jonathan Goldhill. I think I'm the only one with that name. Um, you could also find me through my book website, DisruptiveSuccessor.com, or my uh, business website, my coaching website, TheGoldHillGroup.com, or you could email me directly, J O N at the goldhillgroup.com. Amazing. Well, I'll share that in the show notes for all the listeners. Um, I, again, want to thank you for uh, giving us the time and opportunity to be on this episode. And hopefully some of the listeners got some great advice, tip, tips, and uh, you know, just good nuggets that they can utilize in their entrepreneurial journey. Thanks a lot again, John. Thanks, John. Appreciate it.